here. I really, really hope I'm here. Let me know if you can see me, if you can hear me. It is almost 11 minutes past our usual class starting time, but my laptop would just not connect to the internet today. Yes, I think I am here. But let me know if you can see me, hear me. Okay, I'm going to like get right into the lesson today because we have quite a bit of um, the summer of the beautiful white horse to finish and we are nowhere near close to completing it. Um, okay, so today we are doing the second part of um, the summer of the beautiful white horse. Hello to Pitraj, hello to Ashpreet. Um, thanks for being here and thanks for being here even though I'm late. Before we start, one quick thing, three to four is when our classes usually happen. Tuesdays, Thursdays and Saturdays are when we do grade 11 portions. We've done the first half of the Summer of the Beautiful White Horse so far. Um, the last thing that we saw was Murad sort of taking the horse back to the place where he usually keeps it, which is this abandoned barn. And um, both Murad and Aram are now leaving the barn, right? That is the place that we are in. And we're going to get into reading. They began walking home. It wasn't easy, he said, to get the horse to behave so nicely. At first, it wanted to run wild. But, as I've told you, I have a way with a horse. I can get it to want to do anything I want it to do. Horses understand me. So Murad and Aram have left the horse in the barn and now they are walking back home. And um, Murad says, oh, you know, the horse wasn't always this good with me. Once upon a time, it just wanted to run away wherever it wanted to run to. But I have a way with the horse and this is that same streak of like showing off that Murad was doing a little bit earlier, right? He was kind of telling Aram, I have an understanding of the horse, you might not, but I do. And that same quality comes back here. Murad is repeating that he has a way with the horse and he says, I can get it to want to do anything I want it to do, which is to say, I can influence the horse and become good enough friends with it that it will also want to do what I want to do. So I won't be forcing it to do something I want to do, but I'll be but I'll be creating a relationship with it that makes what I want to do and what it wants to do the same thing. And then he says horses understand me. How do you do it? I said. And Aram is curious. Aram is like, how? Because just today he got on the horse and the horse threw him off and, you know, went away wherever it wanted to go to. I have an understanding with the horse, he said. And Murad, you know, is being very vague about this. He just says, I have an understanding with the horse. Oh, horses understand me. And Aram's like, yes, but what sort of an understanding, I said. But Aram wants to understand exactly what is going on. So he keeps pushing Murad and he's like, what is the understanding that you have? Because he too wants to build this kind of understanding with a horse. A simple and honest one, he said. And Murad is back to giving us vague answers. He says, oh, I have a simple and an honest understanding with a horse. And what does that mean, right? That's the question that this paragraph offers us. What is this understanding? And the implication in saying it's a simple and honest understanding, in saying um, I get it to want to do what I want it to do, all of this suggests that Murad is kind of taking good care of the horse and he is trying to build a relationship of love with the horse in a way that the horse also wants to please him, you know, and that seems to be the understanding that they're building and we'll see how Murad does this in a little bit again. Let me know if you have any questions. I'm checking the chat and I will definitely answer your questions if you have any. 
Hello to Ishu. Well, I said, I wish I knew how to reach an understanding like that with a horse. And Aram says his wish out loud. He's like, oh, I want what you have. You're still a small boy, he said. When you get to be 13, you'll know how to do it. And Murad is back on his high horse. He's sort of like looking down at Aram again. And he's like, oh, you know, you're still little. And when you're older, you'll know how to do it. And this kind of suggests that maybe Murad also doesn't entirely know how he does it. Because in all of these moments, he's not telling us real answers, right? He's just telling us like, oh, later you'll find out. At some point in your life, you'll know. I went home and ate a hearty breakfast. Um, so Aram has gone home now and Aram eats a very hearty, hearty is filling and full breakfast and he really needs it because he spent a lot of energy today, early in the morning, running around with the horse, right? Yeah, this phrase, you know, you're still a small boy, you'll know how to do it when you're older. It's a phrase that people use a lot whenever there's any kind of age difference. It's another way of sort of like establishing that slight sibling rivalry that's going on between Aram and Murad throughout like this story. Hello to Swati. Um, Okay, let me know if you have any questions. I am checking the chat every once in a while and I will be keeping track of any questions that you have. That afternoon, my uncle Khusro came to our house for coffee and cigarettes. He sat in the parlor, sipping and smoking and remembering the old country. Then another visitor arrived, a farmer named John Bayo, an Assyrian who, out of loneliness, had learned to speak Armenian. So Uncle Kusro visits the house of Aram that particular day. He just comes by to hang out with his family. He's drinking some coffee, he's smoking some cigarettes, and he's reminiscing about the old country. We spoke about what this old country might be earlier, right? Um, we spoke about how um, possibly country that it is right now, Armenia has become a little more modernized, they lived very differently back then and that kind of nostalgia for the old country is what Kusrov is bringing back here. And we know that Kusrov is the crazy uncle in case you've forgotten that. Um, and at the moment that Kusrov is home, someone else comes to visit them and this is someone called John Bayro and he is someone from Assyria and he lives in Armenia now. And out of loneliness, he had learned to speak Armenian. You know, that's a really nice line and we'll talk about what it tells us in a moment. My mother brought the lonely visitor coffee and tobacco and he rolled a cigarette and sipped and smoked. And then at last, sighing sadly, he said, my white horse which was stolen last month is still gone. I cannot understand it. Um, Adam's mother brings this new visitor coffee and tobacco also and this man also starts smoking and drinking coffee and you know he's just sitting there and then at the end he's sort of like sighing really sadly and he says my white horse got stolen and it got stolen last month. Now we know that there's a white horse that was recently stolen and it's in the hands of Burak. Right? And Aram was wondering just now how long Murad had stolen the horse, how long ago Murad had stolen the horse, and now he has his answer. It's that the horse got stolen a month ago. And he also has a confirmation that Murad definitely stole the horse, right? Like he must have gone to wherever the horse was kept and taken the horse. Because um, this doesn't seem like a situation in which John Bayro has lost the horse and Murad has found it or anything like that. John Bayro very clearly states it was stolen and he's saying i can't understand it and this is very odd um if your horse is stolen then of course it'll still be gone um so when he says i cannot understand it he's just expressing a sort of discontentment with this entire situation he's not saying i don't understand how my horse got stolen or anything like that my uncle kasro became very irritated and shouted it's no harm what is the loss of a horse haven't we all lost the homeland? What is this crying over a horse? 
and we know kusro reacts like this all the time right he says it's no harm um pay no attention to it and again here too even though somebody uh, in front of him is very obviously distressed kusro says it's no harm what's the loss of a horse why are you crying over a horse we've all lost the homeland and this suggests again that they've like lost some kind of connection with armenia um it's not clear within the story what that particular loss is but yeah there is some sense of loss and some sense of change between whatever the old country was and whatever this new country is and one of the changes that we've seen as i already said was is this particular fact that the old country was more open to things like people like riding horses and singing really loudly on streets and now all of that is considered a little more unnatural um but yeah kusro is like your pain makes no sense to me so you give me a second that may be all right for you a city dweller to say john byro said but what of my sari what good is a sari without a horse a sari is a cart um you hitch it to a horse and you take the cart around to places and john byro says yeah you might say that the loss of a horse means nothing to you because you live in the city and you don't have horses but i depend on my horse cart to take me places and what am i supposed to do with my cart if i don't have a horse pay no attention to it my uncle kusro to it and uncle kusro just repeats himself he's like i don't care i walk 10 miles to get here john byro said because john byro has no other form of transportation anymore john byro has had to walk all the way from wherever he lives in the countryside and he says i walk 10 miles to reach your house you have legs my uncle kusro shouted uncle kusro is one of those relatives who is you know extremely unhelpful whenever you are in a bad situation they're just like trying to eliminate your problem and pretend you don't have a problem you know that's kind of what uncle kusro is doing all the time my left leg pains me the farmer said and the farmer's like well i do have legs but like my leg hurts pay no attention to it my uncle kusro told and uncle kusro repeats the same thing that he's been repeating all this time that horse cost me 60 dollars the farmer said and now we have also a specific value attached to the horse it's 60 dollars so it's worth quite a bit of money and the farmer is expressing like the fact that it was worth a bit of money and so the loss of the horse is the loss of that money also i spit on money by uncle kusro said and uncle kusro has a reply for that too he's like i don't care about money money is worthless it's so worthless that i'd spit on it he got up and stalked out of the house slamming the screen door and then he's clearly gotten sick of this conversation so he just gets up and he leaves the whole house um couple of things that we should talk about with regard to like what we just read one we have just found the owner so we know that like this theft is very real right and the fact that there is somebody that the horse has been stolen from also makes it very real that somebody has been affected by this thievery um and we also see like the farmer layout for us in like multiple ways the ways that he's been affected one he can't use his cart two he has to walk three his leg is hurting so like even like trying to find somebody to talk to even if that requires like a lot of effort it affects him physically and three and four sorry it's also monetarily like affected him because he spent money on the horse and presumably he's also spent money on taking care of the horse and growing it this far right so all of that is highlighted for us in this particular conversation and so we also know the very real consequences of what murad has done which wasn't something that we were thinking about so far because we were very focused on the feelings of murad and aram and the way that they were so happy going around with this horse right we also had like that little paragraph where aram was like maybe this isn't thieving at all but now from the perspective of the owner what we get is that this was definitely definitely that another couple of things that we get is um in this conversation we see how uncle kusro was sort of like rejecting every point that john byro brings up 
and each time John Pyro responds by offering a new reason as to why like his old reasons make sense and his worry makes sense and Uncle Kusrov still goes ahead and like refuses to accept that this worry is something to be worried about and um, that tells us something about the characteristic of Uncle Kusrov, right? He really, really doesn't care. Um, and it also tells us about the futility of trying to convince someone who doesn't care that, you know, they should care and that there are reasons to care. It would be much better, honestly, in this case, if the farmer had just, like, stopped talking because there's no convincing Uncle Kusrov. He just doesn't want to be convinced. My mother explained, he has a gentle heart, she said. It is simply that he is homesick and such a large man. And um, the rest of the family is still there after Uncle Kusro has angrily stopped away and they have to make his excuses for him. So um, in this case, Aram's mother is like, he's actually a really nice man. He's just very homesick for the old country and he's such a large man. And it's, the thing is, neither of these excuses really make sense, right? Um, she's trying to say, oh, he's always frustrated and he's always unhappy and it's because of things that are going on in his life. And these are the sorts of excuses that we generally tend to make for our family members who are unreasonable or irrational. Um, but again, it doesn't necessarily always make logical sense and it doesn't always necessarily mean that what the family members do is acceptable either. Right. The farmer went away and I ran over to Cousin Murat's house. He was sitting under a peach tree, trying to repair the hurt wing of a young robin which could not fly. He was talking to the farmer. John Byro leaves after the mother talks to him and then um, after the farmer is gone, the first thing that Aram does is he goes to Murat's house and Murat is sitting under a tree and he has found a little bird which has injured wings that are stopping it from flying and he is trying to heal that little bird, right? He is trying to like take care of it as best as he can and he is talking to it. So two things, um, I already talked to you about like how that particular paragraph gives us a little bit to think about when it comes to how we explain away our families. But another thing that we also come back to in this paragraph is Murad and the way that he has with animals. And that is just genuine, sincere care, right? He is talking to the animal like the animal is something to be talked to, which is something that a lot of people don't do. They tend to think, oh, it's an animal. I'll just make it do whatever I want it to do. But Murad is sort of like talking to it, treating it like it's something that's alive. And he's trying to take care of an injured bird, which is something that a lot of people would consider to be extremely useless. But it shows us that Murad has a lot of affection for these animals. And he really genuinely wants to help them. What is it? He said. The farmer, John Bido, I said. He visited our house. He wants his horse. You've had it a month. I want you to promise not to take it back until I learn to ride. And Murad's like, what's up? Why are you here? And Aram's like, oh, the farmer came to our house. He wants his horse. Of course, he wants his horse. It was stolen from him. Um, Murad you've had this horse for a month, I know that now, and I want you to promise that you won't take the horse back until I finish learning how to ride. It will take you a year to learn to ride, my cousin Murad said. We could keep the horse a year, I said. My cousin Murad leapt to his feet. And Murad's like, it's going to take you a year to learn to ride. And Adam's like, well, you know, you've kept the horse for a month, we might as well keep it for a year. And Murad is, clearly shocked by this because he leaps to his feet which indicates that it isn't something that he can hear just sitting down he has to like get on his feet and like respond to it so two things here um one thing that we see is that aram isn't really asking murad you know did you steal it anymore we saw that he was repeatedly sort of framing it in the form of a question for murad he was like did you steal it when did you steal it where did you get it from all of that is gone now he has his answer so he's like i know this is the truth i know who you stole it from i know when you stole it and we also see that aram hasn't come here to warn his cousin that john byro is like still thinking about the horse and still worried about the horse. 
he's just there to like convince his cousin not to give the horse back he's trying to convince his cousin in fact to keep the horse for longer so that he himself can learn how to ride so his motive is entirely selfish in this particular case he's not thinking about john byro he's not thinking about his cousin he's not thinking about the horse either he's just thinking i want to learn to ride i'm going to check to see if you have any questions Hello Vaishnavi and Ayush Good afternoon and that's okay that you're late um I was also late today so you haven't missed too much Ma'am jab wo to tum koi return karte hai to usko to usko Yeah Vaishnavi you're asking a good question which is basically just oh when the boy is like return the horse then won't the horse owner ask them like where's the horse been for this long um and we'll see how they return the horse and why this question doesn't come up at all okay we'll see it in like just a little bit what he wrote are you inviting a member of the garo clanian family to steal the horse must go back to its true owner and here murad gets really angry when aram says why don't we just keep it for a year he's like are you telling me to steal and he doesn't say me he says a member of the garo clanian family which brings back the fact that the garo clanian family has this particular value right where they're very determined never to steal and never to thieve and always to be honest so in this moment murad is thinking of himself as a member of the family and he is like are you telling me me who is a member of this family who also lives by these principles that i should steal no the horse will definitely go back to john byro when i said and aram's like sure but it's already been with you for one month so when is it going back to the owner in 6 months at the latest he said and murad offers this random arbitrary number for us it is 6 months in 6 months the horse will definitely go back he says he threw the bird into the air the bird tried hard almost fell twice but at last flew away high and straight and he still has that injured bird in his hand and he throws the injured bird into the air and the bird like sort of almost falls but then finally flies away which tells us that murad is also good at taking care of animals not only does he want to take care of them he like actually takes care of them well too the interesting thing that we get from this paragraph really is just that particular line when murad is like oh 6 months at the latest but he is so angry when aram says why don't you keep the horse for a year so a year is too long but half a year is okay and what does this mean right um it doesn't really make sense how is 6 months all right but 6 more months not okay and all we can really say is that maybe when aram says a year it sounds like too long to murad it sounds like oh that's such a long period of time and if i keep the horse for that long then i will be stealing um but then when aram says okay when are you going to return it murad doesn't want to give like a shorter time frame right he doesn't want to say oh i'll give it back next month or i'll give it back next week because we know he's really attached to the horse too so he goes for like a frame of time that's longer than a short duration like a week or a month but that is still shorter than the amount that aram offered which he got angry at so he's gone for this random number that's in between like too short and too long and that's 6 months right it doesn't necessarily mean that 6 months is particularly meaningful or anything like that and another thing that we see here is that neither of these two are you know feeling any kind of guilt so far right they're not like saying oh i feel so bad that the horse got stolen and even though arams listen to john byro sort of go on and on about all of the pains he is facing due to the thievery of the horse aram isn't like oh we should give the horse back to him that's not what he came back to tell me that he's just like okay cool we have the horse let's keep it for longer um and murad also doesn't like feel any kind of guilt there's also no fear in either of them that they're going to get caught 
and also no sort of conscience that they're showing at all. But still, they repeat that family philosophy again and again. And by this point, the family philosophy has become mostly meaningless, right? We've heard so much about how the Garuglanian family is supposed to be very honest and full of integrity. But our primary two examples from the family, which are Murad and Aram, clearly don't care very much for honesty or for any sort of non-thieving integrity. So by this time, the readers have become very skeptical of this family philosophy and the truth of this family philosophy. Early every morning for two weeks, my cousin Murad and I took the horse out of the barn of the deserted vineyard where we were hiding it and rode it. And every morning the horse, when it was my turn to ride alone, leapt over grapevines and small trees and threw me and ran away. Nevertheless, I hoped in time to learn to ride the way my cousin Murad rode. So for the next two weeks, uh, Murad and Aram go get the horse every morning and they ride it every morning and every single morning the horse does the same thing that it did on the very first day. When Aram gets on it alone, it sort of just runs wherever it wants to and it throws Aram off, which tells us that Aram still hasn't found any sort of understanding with the horse yet. But Aram is still hopeful and he says, okay, in time, I will learn. Maybe in a year, maybe less than that. Um, and his aspiration is his cousin Murad. He wants to be like his cousin Murad and he wants to ride the horse like his cousin Murad. One morning on the way to Petvajan's deserted vineyard, we ran into the farmer John Byron, who was on his way to town. And one day, when they're on the way back to the deserted vineyard where they have to drop the horse back, they run into the farmer from whom the horse has been stolen. Let me do the talking, my cousin Murad said. I have a way with farmers. Murad's like, okay, you don't talk to him. I'll talk to him. I'll handle this. I have a way with farmers. Murad has a way with horses. He has a way with farmers. He has a way with everyone and everything, clearly. Good morning, John Byro, my cousin Murad said to the farmer. And Murad initiates conversation with the farmer, right? And this tells us maybe he is good at talking because if you've stolen somebody's um, horse and you're on the horse and you're crossing them, then presumably you'd want to avoid them, right? You'd look like sort of shifty, you'd try to like run away from the scene or something like that. But Murad does none of that. Instead, he like actually talks to the farmer very openly. He's like, good morning. And that dispels some of the suspicion that like the other person will have immediately. Because if someone's not trying to hide from you, and if someone's not trying to keep something from you, then you become less suspicious of the fact that they might have done something wrong. The farmer studied the horse eagerly, but the farmer still catches sight of the horse and it's the first thing that the farmer wants to, you know, think about. Good morning, son of my friends, he said. What is the name of your horse? And he says, good morning, both of you. And uh, what's the name of your horse? Where did you get this horse from? Who is this horse? My heart, my cousin Murad said in Armenian. And Murad says a word in Armenian, uh, which translates to my heart, and that may be what he has named the horse. And from this particular paragraph, what we get is that Murad is excellent at dealing with stressful situations. Um, he's the thief, he's fully gotten caught in this situation, and yet he's just handling, handling it with finesse, right? He's not even like breaking a sweat, he's just absolutely cool. Yeah, the farmer studies the horse very eagerly. He wants to know if it's his. And Murad says, my heart is the name of this horse. And in one way, it's very touching because the horse really has like made its way into his heart. And in one way, it really is his heart. A lovely name, John Byro said, for a lovely horse. I could swear it's the horse that was stolen from me many weeks ago. May I look into his mouth? Um, John Byro says, oh, that's a lovely name, this is a lovely horse. Actually, it looks sort of like the horse that was stolen from me. Can I look into its mouth? And um, how people identify horses is by looking at their teeth. So what John Byro is really asking here is, can I check if this horse is mine? Of course, Murad said. And again, Murad plays it so well. 
he's just like yeah of course you can he doesn't fidget he isn't like oh well you know i don't know like it's really not your horse he doesn't deny anything he's just like i have nothing to hide you may look into the mouth of the horse the farmer looked into the mouth of the horse tooth for tooth he said the farmer looks at the mouth of the horse he sees the teeth of the horse and he says it's tooth for tooth which is to say this horse is exactly the same as my horse each tooth matches the tooth of the the teeth to the teeth that my horse had i would swear it's my horse if i didn't know your parents the fame of your family for honesty is well known to me yet the horse is the twin of my horse a suspicious man would believe his eyes instead of his heart good day my young friend So the farmer says, "Oh, this looks exactly like my horse, and I would say it is my horse, except I know your parents, I know your family, and I know that your family is well known for honesty. Even so, this horse does look like my horse, exactly like my horse. But you know what? A suspicious man would believe his eyes instead of his heart, which is to say, someone else might." look at this horse see that it looks like his horse and say this is my horse and you stole the horse but i'm not going to pay attention to what my eyes are telling me which is that this is my horse i'm going to pay attention to what my heart is telling me which is that your family doesn't steal and so of course you couldn't have stolen my horse so of course this can't be my horse and he says good day my young friends and he closes the conversation and he leaves right and what a fascinating scene um in this particular case again we see a situation where like this belief in what a family is like this belief in what a family values takes precedence over like real life evidence that you're seeing in front of your eyes we saw this in aram at the very in the very very first paragraph aram is extremely surprised when he sees the horse he's like the horse can't really be here even though it's like breathing and i can smell it because nobody in my family steals he can't believe the evidence of his eyes and similarly here john byro refuses very deliberately not to believe the evidence of his eyes he sort of like decides that he can't believe his eyes and instead he should just trust whatever he knows of this family i'm going to check to see if you have any questions no questions so i'm going to go ahead and carry on um yeah we talked about what's going here going on here we spoke about that sort of precedence of the family philosophy over like real evidence um and it's a very interesting choice that john byro has been making here we can't really tell if he really means it or if he's just thinking about the fact that oh if i like accuse these children of stealing the horse and it goes to their parents and then we find out that it's not the horse at all then my friendship with this family will be broken because this family takes a lot of pride in their honesty and their friendship matters more to me than maybe like this horse and my suspicions about this horse and we already have this context where we know that John Byro is lonely so lonely that he has learned another language in order to be friends with the people who live there so all of these things maybe go into john byro's consideration we can't tell if he is like an entirely naive man or if he's thought through all of these things and then he has made this particular decision to listen to his heart instead of his eyes early the following morning we took the horse to john byro's vineyard and put it in the barn The dogs followed us around without making a sound. The dogs, I whispered to my cousin Murad, I thought they would bark. They would at someone else, he said. I have a way with dogs. My cousin Murad put his arms around the horse, pressed his nose into the horse's nose, patted it, and then we went away. 
the very next day after they meet John Byrow, what they do is they take the horse to John Byrow's vineyard and they put it back in the barn. And Vaishnavi, this answers your question, right? Um, they entirely avoid like any questions about um, giving the horse back to John Byrow because they just do it like without telling him. It's like one morning he woke up and his horse was gone, one morning he woke up and his horse was back. So he might just think like it happened by accident, it was a miracle that happened or something like that, right? Um, he doesn't actually have to like confront the thieves and Murad and Aram don't have to confront him either. They do it as secretly as Murad stole the horse. And when they're doing it, John Barrow has dogs in the particular like where he lives. But the dogs are just following these two strangers around without making any sort of noise. And Aram says, you know, I thought the dogs would bark because people generally keep dogs to be guardians of the house, right? Um, they're supposed to bark when strangers come in, but they aren't barking in this case. And Murad says, they bark at somebody else. I have a way with dogs. Again, Murad is showing off a little bit here, but we also know that it's true that he does have really good connections with animals and he's successfully stolen the horse without the dogs making any sort of like hue and cry right the dogs didn't warn john byro when he stole the horse which tells us that maybe he spent some time becoming friends with the dogs maybe feeding the dogs maybe playing with them something like that and so these dogs know murad and so they're not barking and then at the very end murad hugs the horse he sort of affectionately like puts his nose against the horse's nose and he pats the horse and then they both leave. It's quite a touching like ending scene. Um, it's a goodbye and well, Murad has spent a month with this horse and now he's letting it go. Checking to see if you have any questions before we talk about themes. Hello Divyansh. I'm sorry, I don't know Hindi, so I can't explain in Hindi. Um, I have to teach in English. But if you have any questions, um, I can see that you said you don't understand. Tell me what you don't understand. Um, if there's any specific line you didn't understand, or if you didn't understand any of what I said, and I'll repeat it, okay? is yesterday just yesterday they met the farmer and they were like oh yeah hello good morning and he was like is this my horse oh it looks like my horse oh it's not my horse and they didn't tell him it was his horse at all right they just let him like leave but the very next day they returned the horse and this is an interesting point at which for them for them to return the horse because they do it immediately after they've met John Byro and this could tell us one of two things either they're afraid that he'll complain to their parents or he'll tell somebody or they're afraid that um or the second thing is that they're afraid that you know he really does believe them and that makes them feel bad so one of two options here fear of being caught and um a conscience some guilt finally but we also see in the conversation with john byro that john byro believes them he completely thinks that like it's their own horse and it's not his horse. He's not accused them at all. And he said, no, no, your family, I know, I know you all. So I'm not going to question you. I'm just going to trust in you. And so actually they have no real fear of being caught anymore. He clearly doesn't think like they've stolen it. It's not something he's going to take up. So all that remains is that they must be feeling a little guilty, right? A little bad. Um, and so they return this horse and if you know the most common like question that comes up again and again with the story the sort of dilemma in the story is why do these boys return the horse and we can understand why they return the horse through this kind of process of elimination right they clearly don't need to be afraid of being caught because john byro doesn't think they've stolen the horse at all so the only other reason that they could be returning it is because 
John Bayrou has seen them and he believes them. And when he believes them, they feel a little guilty. They feel a little bad about what they've done because they are actually like lying to him. And they are actually like going against their family philosophy. And somebody has chosen to believe that philosophy over the fact that, you know, they really have stolen the horse. And even though all this time they themselves have given no thought to the family philosophy, when they see how somebody else places so much value in it, they feel a little bit of guilt for betraying it also. So all of these things kind of come together and conscience is exactly why they wind up returning this horse. That afternoon, John Bayrou came to our house in his Surrey and showed my mother the horse that had been stolen and returned. That very afternoon, John Bayrou, you know, his Surrey is finally working now because he has his horse back. He comes to the house, he shows Aram's mother the horse. I do not know what to think. He said, the horse is stronger than ever. Better tempered too. I thank God. And John Barry is like, I don't know what to think. The horse is back. And not only is the horse back, it's not in any kind of bad condition. It's in a better condition. It's physically stronger and it's nicer in general. So I'll just thank God. And, you know, this is also interesting because he must be able to make the connection, right? Just the day before, he saw these boys with the horse and the very next day, the horse is back in his stable. But he chooses clearly not to like pursue that line of thought. Instead, he's just kind of like, I thank God that my horse is back with me and my horse is well. My uncle Kusro, who was in the parlor, became irritated and shouted, Quiet man, quiet. Your horse has been returned. Pay no attention to it. And Uncle Kusro is in the parlor and as usual he is irritated and as usual he shouts the thing that he always shouts which is pay no attention to it. And he's like your horse is back, who cares? Um, two things that we should think about when we end on this uh, particular paragraph. One thing is they have taken good care of the horse and John Byro clearly appreciates that too. Um, and the second thing is, we end on the note, your horse has been returned, pay no attention to it. And pay no attention to it is very interesting here because Kusra is saying, oh, don't pay any attention to it, it doesn't matter. But very much, in fact, John Bayro is paying no attention to it, right? He is paying no attention to a lot of the suspicious circumstances under which this horse has been returned. He is not paying attention to the very suspicious way in which he saw these boys with the horse yesterday and today the horse is back in his stable. So very deliberately, he is actually not paying attention to, for instance, um, the way the horse disappeared, the way the horse reappeared. And all of this shows us something about John Byron, which is either that he is a little naive or that he is a good-hearted person. And that brings us to the end of our story, but we have a couple of quick themes to talk about. Um, one is the connection between poverty and stealing, which we see here very clearly in the story. Aram and Murad only steal the horse because they really want a horse and they can't afford a horse, right? So even though throughout the story, we're also kind of consistently grappling with that question of, is it okay for them to have stolen the horse? We have this explanation as to why they've stolen the horse. And we have this way for us to understand the fact that they've stolen the horse. And so we can't really hate Aram or Murad or tell them, oh, you've done the wrong thing and you're terrible people. All we can say is, this is a bit of a complicated situation. This is clearly not a black and white situation. You've stolen the horse and it's affected somebody else in a bad way, but you also really want the horse and it's given you some kind of joy. So it's very difficult to criticize you for what you've done. So all of that comes up in this story. Another question that comes up in the story is what is stealing? And in this particular case, like they've stolen this horse, they've kept it for a month, but then they gave it back. And does that count as stealing? And we don't have an answer to this, right? And it's very difficult to be able to answer that. But again, it pushes us to kind of question our ideas of what is thievery, what is theft, what is right, what is wrong, and are there maybe like in-betweens where we can offer like more nuanced ideas of these things, where we don't have to say, if you take something from someone, then it's definitely stealing. 
where we can instead say well they did take it but like they also returned it so maybe the word stealing is a bit of a heavy word for this particular circumstance the third thing that we get is um this repetitive motif of honor um honor 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 the family honor their family philosophy this particular belief in like being honorable and full of integrity being decent people being good people and there's clearly like a specific way in which this family understands it and that is not stealing and not lying and doing all the right things and taking no advantage of anybody ever but there's honor also in what murad and aram do which is even after they've done something and they feel like what they've done is wrong they go ahead and correct that error and there too we see honor and it's a divergence from the way the family understands honor which is not making that crime at all here aram and murad make the crime, perform the crime and then they correct it which is a different kind of honor also and a very respectable thing to do and the last thing that we should talk about is the close relationship between family and conscience in the story all of this like talk about honor all of this talk about like being a good person all of it is rooted in their family for aran and murad right um this phrase the garoglanian family keeps coming back up again and again and we're told throughout the story that it's only because of this particular family system that they have this kind of conscience it's only because of their particular family system that finally at the end they listen to their conscience um so conscience is something that's built in the family it's constructed by the family it's constructed by the sort of circumstances you grow up in the people that you grow up around all of those people are the ones who tell you what's wrong what's right what you can do what you shouldn't do how you should live your life and in this case every that repetitive kind of fear that aram has that like oh we've stolen oh no we've stolen in the beginning and that kind of conclusion where they return the horse after john byro expresses faith in the fact that they are all honest all of it comes back to the family and what the family thinks is right but we can see also that it's entirely possible for us to like do things that are different from our family and break away from the moral systems of our family and aram and murad do this by um stealing they do something that like their family would definitely think is wrong but you can expand this particular concept beyond the story and think about it right um there are many things that you and i have probably grown up with a lot of moral systems value systems judgment systems family is always telling you what to do what not to do what is okay what is not okay and very often like as we grow we will find that we agree with some of it and we may not agree with some of it and what's really needed in these cases is to kind of think about what we agree with and what we don't agree with and figure out what's right and what's wrong for ourselves and in this particular case um madam murad and aram go on that journey for themselves they do something their family considers wrong they're kind of okay with it and then eventually they to find out that it is wrong and so they do what's right um a little bit of a trajectory in which they kind of are like okay we're going to break off from our family philosophy and then come back um and that kind of thing is something that we can do to sort of just take time to figure out what's right what's wrong what works for us um and that brings us to the end of the lesson i think so let me know if you have any questions Tanu, you said you don't understand. I want to know what you don't understand. Oh, you've left. Oh no. Well, okay. Um, if you have any questions, then leave them for me in the comments and tell me whatever it is you don't understand, and I'll definitely get back to you. Okay. Ayush, um, Mandy, for this chapter will be on Tuesday. um we will we'll, we we'll, we'll do grade 11 on tuesday thursday saturday so on those days we'll do like the rest of the snapshots chapters and we'll do the quizzes also okay okay 
thanks for being here, all of you. And um, before you leave, I just want to let you know about this thing called the Unacademy Combat Scholarship Test, which is basically like a random test that you can do and you can sign up for it for free. Um, there is a link in the description box below. You can click on it, you can enroll for it, you can take the quiz. It's like 45 minutes long. And if you do well in it, you can win a lot of really great scholarships that are worth quite a lot of money, right? So this is something you should definitely consider doing, if only because it costs you nothing. Um, it could bring you a lot of like benefits. And also, it's a great way for you to revise. So think about signing up for this test. The link is in my description box. I also want to let you know about the Unacademy app. It's the learner's app that's on Google Play, on the Apple App Store. You can download it and you can try a lot of features on it for free. There are live quizzes, there are mock tests. There is an ask a doubt feature where you can basically sort of like screenshot the doubt that you have, put it up, select the subject that it falls under and somebody will get back to you and answer any of your questions that you may have about any of your lessons in any of your subjects. So the Unacademy Learners app can be really useful for you. Download it, um, sign up for it, and you can use my code to do that. It is THAR01. There is also something called Unacademy Plus that Unacademy offers, which is basically access to all of these classes that cover all of your portions. Um, it's like the YouTube classes, but a lot more courses like that and a lot more like subject material is discussed in the plus classes um, you also get like unlimited access to like study material um, you get practice tests and live tests and a lot of extra features basically these are the prices for an academy plus and as you can see the price varies um, based on the duration that you take the subscription for but if you take it for longer, then the per month cost is a lot less. There is also another feature that Unacademy offers called Unacademy Iconic, in which you get to learn on your own in conversation with educators, which is to say that they focus completely on you. You get one-on-one -on -one tutoring, one-on-one -on -one education, um, individual like work where you get reports on your work, you kind of get to like see exactly what you need help with, see exactly what you are good at, how you can improve in what you're not good at. Um, you'll also get access to like live doubt solving sessions with your um, educators and your parents can also speak to the educators to learn about how you're doing. So if you are looking for something that is not a collective classroom experience and is instead maybe a single person like focused experience, then you should go for an Academy Iconic. These are the prices of Iconic. As you can see, the prices vary based on like the different different months. Again, the durations that you take it for. But again, the same thing as with Plus Schools, which is that the per month cost is a lot less if you take it for a longer duration of time. For both Plus and Iconic, you can use my referral code. It is THAR01, as I already said, and that should give you a flat 10% discount. Check out the Unacademy app and check out these subscriptions. Um, they could be really useful to you. Um, and if you're interested, then they are always available for you to take advantage of. Having said all that, thank you for being here with me on the Unacademy platform on YouTube today. If you like this session, then please leave a like. Um, leave comments if you have questions. I know some of you had questions, but I couldn't catch them in time. So leave them in the form of comments. I check the comments and I will definitely get back to you. Um, also, do subscribe if you are looking for more content like this because we are putting out content like this every day. See you tomorrow.